Welcome to Your Family Dog, a podcast dedicated to helping families love living with dogs. Hi, and welcome back to Your Family Dog. I'm Julie Spudge Smith, and I'm here with Tina Spring. And today, we could not be more excited about our guest. We have Mark Beckoff with us. And for those in the dog world, I know you have heard of Mark Beckoff, but for those of you who are not perhaps as entrenched, Let me give you just a a glimpse of his bio. He is the Professor Emeritus of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Colorado Boulder. He's a fellow of the Animal Behavior Society and a past Guggenheim fellow. If that were not enough, this very talented man has written somewhere between 30 to 40 books, depending on how you choose to count it. He is a good friend of Jane Goodall. He has a brand new book coming out that we're thrilled to be able to introduce to you called Dogs Demystified, an A to Z guide to all things canine. And he has agreed to come on and talk to us about all things canine, including his new book, um, How It Is That One Can Become a Canine Ethologist Without a Degree. Anyway, welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us here on Your Family Dog. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for your kind words and your interest in my work. So you want to tell us a little bit about this new book? Sure. Um, you know, it's it's laid out from A to Z, so it's not a book that people have to read from cover to cover. I mean, I haven't counted it recently, but there could be 700 entries, all alphabetical, some longer than the others from from A to Z. So, you know, aggression, abnormal behavior, biting. I'm trying to go chronologically, consciousness, communication, things like detailing, if you will, you know, lopping off tails, Um, you know, all the way to Z, you know, our dogs, Zen dogs, you know, because 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 one of the things the dog wants, <laughs> when the dog and the book want to put to sleep is these myths. So, you know, people go, well, dogs just live in the present. They don't really care about anything else. And of course they don't. I mean, if you have ever rescued a dog who's had a bad upbringing, you know, that haunts them and they think about the future. Um, so and it covers behavior, you know, a lot. I mean, countless different behavior patterns, um, talks about different breeds um, and and really, you know, your question about becoming an ethologist without a degree is what motivated me to write the book or largely motivated me to have people become citizen scientists. I just love that term, citizen scientist. Yeah, because they are doing science, even if they don't have a degree and they don't sit in, you know, a desk in the ivory tower. Um, and I and I and I really like, you know, the idea of getting people interested. The appendix in Canine Confidential is is basically a chapter of the book, you know, called How to Become a Canine Ethologist. Um, and it's a great question because it really opens the door for discussing lots of things like how do you do it? Well, you carefully watch the animals, each dog. Um, you learn really rapidly that each and every dog is an individual, even litter mates when they're I mean, even litter mates when they're three weeks old, when I studied wild coyotes and I've been with wild wolves, when they come out of the den at three weeks of age, give or take, they're unique individuals with unique personalities or, you know, although they've been in the same hole in the ground with the same mom, dad and and sibs, um, you you can watch them. The great thing today is when I started, you know, you had to lug all these cameras around and you didn't have the computer to analyze film. But on your iPhone or whatever kind of smartphone you have, you can film them and then play the films back and watch them. And by and large, everyone loves it. You know, every now and again, somebody will say, well, I got this dog, but I don't feel like studying them. And it's just too much work. And I always say, well, that's okay. You don't have to do it, but it's easy to do. Um, And, you know, you, you have them uh, write down and describe all the different behaviors that a dog performs um you get them to um think about what you know context that you know dogs will mount and hump other dogs in a lot of different contexts i mean it's not only sexual it's not only aggression it could be in play 
or they could just wind up in that position <laughs> and go, oh, my goodness, what's going on here? Um, you know, you can look at m- urination set marking patterns. I mean, by and large, I'll have to say that of the n- countless responses I've had to people learning to do this, 99.999% of them positive. And the down, the upside is that it gets them to learn who their dog is. And that, m- that, f- fosters and maintains a very close social bond. Yeah. Right. Well, the thing I was thinking when you were talking about that is that not only do you get to know your dog and you know your dog under positive conditions, that makes it so much easier for you to recognize when things are starting to go south, when things are not, your dog's not responding well to the situation and you can get him out of there. Because if you know what it's like when he's happy and he's responding well, when that starts to change, you're just you're just much more observant, and I think then that, that allows you to get your dog into a safe situation much more quickly than waiting until it's escalated to the point where it's obvious this is going sideways. Right, and it also learn, um, ha- enables you to learn who your dog is and whether or not some behavior um, they're performing means that they need veterinary care. You yeah, know, I mean, yeah, you know, you know, you can. There's behaviors that can occur that, you know, excessively or people say that are OK. But, you know, if you know your dog and they're not and they usually play full, but they're not playing or they usually eat, but they're not eating or they're usually social with other dogs and they're not, you know, just as with humans, there could be something wrong with them. And you kind of just have to decide whether it's time to seek a, you know, like a positive force free trainer, veterinary care. Or a dog psychologist. Um, But you can only do that when you know your dog as the individual who they are. Yeah, I just was, when you were saying that, I was thinking about my first flat-coated retriever, uh, Bingley. um, He'd had some swelling around his left front elbow, and he seemed to be fine, and the swelling went down a little bit. But then one day we were playing, and he just, and this is a dog who would have played fetch for seven, eight hours a day if I'd Mm -hmm. let him. You know, after about 30 minutes, he just pulled up and stopped. And I went, whoa, that's not my dog. That's not what he does. This needs to be checked out. And it turned out he ended up having histiocytic sarcoma. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And uh, so, but it was just like knowing, no, that's not him. That's not who he is. And I think that owners, as you begin to get to know your dog better, and you can begin to predict how your dog is going to behave in situations. Then when he doesn't or she's off, I think it makes you a much better advocate because you begin to trust yourself. Say, I know my dog better than anybody else, and I know this is wrong. And hopefully your vet's going to say, yeah, got that. I understand. You know your dog better than I do, so let's talk about what you saw, and we'll figure it out from there. Yep. You hit every everything right on the mark, you know, so right. So in addition to just being fun and passing time at a dog park or a dog trail, or even when you've got your dog either alone or with other dogs in your backyard or something like that, you really get to know who they are. And, um, and, and it's really fun. What, I, what, what people tell me is really fun that when, as they learn all these things about their dog, it really um, builds more on the relationship they have with the dog and they don't say they don't get another dog if they decide to get another dog either along with that dog or if they something's happened and they don't have that dog any longer um and they they don't think there's something wrong with the new dog because they didn't they don't do what your former dog does and i've had emails about people saying that and what i always say is got nothing to do with anything but a different personality and you're a different person you know if, if once you, when you get your first dog your relationship with your first dog first dog will be radically different in some cases than with a subsequent it's like having a kid <laughs> you know i mean you know the psychologists look at birth order and they look at all the anomalies or all the positives of being first second or third born um but but it makes it fun. And and I've actually had some really great emails where people, um, they're more limited in, than I was when I lived in the mountains where my dogs always run free without collars or leashes. There were no cars. I mean, there was no danger to them other than, you know, cougars, mountain lions. 
coyotes, foxes, uh, um, and bears. Well, but, and that's nothing, right? I mean, a cougar, a bear, a fox, a coyote, those are those are pretty significant, actually, if you ask oh, me. Are, but, but the point I was going to make is I knew my dogs. I never really formally trained them. But with all the dogs on the road, including my dogs over the years, there was never one, not a single serious encounter. I think part of it was because we got the – when I got my dogs or my neighbors – we immediately taught them, you could say we trained them to look at us from a distance. And every time my hand went to my right pocket, it meant a treat. And they came back because people would say, well, you could just call them. No, if you think there's a bear or a cougar in the neighborhood, you don't want to say, hey, Jethro, come home, because then you're calling attention to them. But once again, the reason I say that is when the dogs hung out around my house, because I had a lot of land and they could be free, they also learned um, on their own signs of danger, and they also enriched their whole lives. I would bury little treats around my property, and sometimes they spend three hours looking for, you know, a little bone, dog bone the size of a marble, <laughs> but it enriched their lives. And, you know, the other lesson that I always try to talk to um, with people is I really believe that the more freedom a dog feels they have to be a dog, the better behaved they will be. And well, I, know I think, that, yeah, that's you know, true. And I mean, if you think about it, that's a, the same thing you write. It's just like having kids. The more you can allow your kid to have some freedom to say, yes, no, I'm comfortable with this. I'm not uncomfortable. You know, I'm not comfortable with that. Then they know they can trust you, that you're being honest with them and that they have some agency over their life. I think anybody who feels like they have agency is yep. going to feel as though I can be more relaxed about who I am because there's a certain element that I have control over. Right. And the two words that are coming up, I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned that, Julie. The two words that are coming up in lots of conversations are agency and consent. And what people mean by that is simply you give the dog as many freedoms as you can so that they can make choices about what they want to do. And consent, meaning, yeah, people say, well, a dog can't really tell you yes or no. Yeah, they can. I mean, if you want a dog to do something and they're pulling away from you or you know your dog has good hearing or vision and you're asking them to do something and they don't and you go say, well, they didn't hear me. Yeah, they heard you. They they just don't want to do it. And so agency and cons really, I was just talking to someone yesterday who's quite a dog expert. And that came up again and again. And um, Jessica Pierce and I wrote a lot about that in our book, Unleashing Your Dog, where give your dog as many freedoms as you can. And there's certain things you can't do. You can't let them run free through the streets of a big city or a town where there are cars. Or if there are predators around like I had, you need to really be sure that they um, they have safety and feel that, you know, they, there's places they can go where they feel safe and they know that they can go there uh, to be safe. But other than that, they can fill their time. They don't want to get hurt. They want to have good lives and they can. It's not as hard as people think once you become fluent in dog. I agree. And, and both Tina and I spend time with our clients teaching dog body language, facial expressions, that kind of thing. But one of the things that I am absolutely insistent upon with all of my owners is that your dog has the right to say who they want to meet, who they don't want to meet, and for how long. And that if you get to know your dog and somebody comes up and says, oh, what a cute dog, can I pet it? It's always fine with me, but you have to ask Zuzu. Precisely. And that's, another, you know, that's another thing I always write about, that it's got to work for everyone involved, including the dog. And Absolutely. It, yeah. Yeah. And it often comes up, you know, about dog parks. So there was an article some years ago that all dog parks are bad. Well, they're not all bad. But but like if your dog wants to go to the dog park and you like to go, go. If your dog doesn't like to go and you like to go, go alone. And if neither of you likes to go, then then don't go at all. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's once again, I think what you said is great. Yeah. You know, can I hug your dog or can I 
you know, can I touch your dog and say good dog? Well, you can, but ask them. Yeah. And, and they will very clearly tell. And they say, well, how do I know if she says yes? I said, the dog will move towards the person. <laughs> you know, and, and, and my Zuzu, um, we don't, I, I, I joke with people that in, in my little village, we have a little village of about 3,000 people, that when we go for a walk through downtown, we actually we don't go for a walk. We go for a lean because Zuzu, everyone she meets, she has to lean into and tell them how much she loves them. And, um, the, but I've had other dogs. It's like, well, you know, you're fine there. I'm fine here. I can see you. I can smell you. I don't really need to have you touch me. And I'm always telling people, I say, you know what? I am giving you permission to say no to somebody. And I'm giving you permission to be your dog's advocate and to step between that person and your dog. If your dog has clearly said, I don't want to be any, I don't want anything to do with that person. And I think sometimes people just need to know that they have the right and the responsibility to advocate for their dog in any given situation. One of the things I was thinking when you were talking about dog parks and, and Tina and I have talked about dog parks on the podcast before. I think you have to know what the dog parks are like in your area. There are some great dog parks. There are some that I would not go to if you paid me a whole lot of money. But one of the things that I think is a great way to find out if you think this is a dog park that you or your dog might enjoy is to go to the dog park without your dog and mm -hmm. stand outside and watch how these dogs interact. Watch how the people interact with their dogs. If they yep. interact with their dogs. I've had been to dog parks where the people don't interact with their dogs at all. And that's when things start to escalate. So, you know, take take the time to go and watch the dog park. And then the next time, if you think it might be a place you want to go with your dog, go and stand outside the dog park with your dog and see how the dogs in the dog park respond and how your dog responds before you plunge them into a situation that they may or may not enjoy. Yeah, it's like choosing a preschool or a day school for your kid. Um, I mean, I know people... I mean, I haven't had to do that, but, you know, I know people who will go alone and they'll just observe and then they'll bring their kid because sometimes when they see what it's like without their kid, it's not a judgment of whether it's good or bad. It's more it's not good or bad for my particular child or my particular dog. But but the reason I wrote these articles was because of the sweeping generalization that all dog parks are bad and they're not all bad. And. And some, some dog parks that are bad for one dog aren't bad for another. But but once again, you know, you could learn that by being your citizen scientist. You can go watch the dogs. How many times are there, um, you know, are there like um, threats or how many times are there serious fights, which which both are very infrequent. But if they happen, you might not want to go to that place, which is fine. Um, I was looking for a chat, a part of Canine Confidential that I wanted to talk to you about that I found really interesting about um, misunderstanding dominance, people, power trips, and bad dogs. And I was wondering if you could, because that's one of the things that I feel like I encounter a lot with people who, like, I go to the dog park and there's this dog and it's always the alpha dog and, and I kind of cringe at that and yep. <laughs> was wondering if you could perhaps address the idea of of dominance and hierarchies a little bit in dogs sure that i was shocked about i mean it could be 15 years ago when because i'm a field ethologist and i study wild coyotes i know wolves and foxes you know all canids um you know jackals for example coyotes and i was shocked to start reading that dogs don't display dominance, and there's no such thing, say, as an alpha animal. Um, I learned really rapidly from reading what people were writing that it was a complete misunderstanding of what those terms mean. So there's no animals that have been studied that don't form some social relationships. But if I dominate you, it doesn't mean I beat you up. It doesn't even mean as if I'm a dog, I growl at you. It means I control your behavior. I control where you go or what you might have access to, but not because I necessarily beat you up. So you can call it whatever you want, but I'm influencing and changing your behavior. And that could be all that dominance is um, in wolves. And I'm, I know that I've got some information on dogs. Um, the highest ranking wolves in a pack have more freedom of movement 
and the lower ranking wolves pay more attention to where they are than they pay attention to um, where other wolves are. So that could be, quote, dominating attention, for example. So when these people were, you know, were saying dogs don't dominate one another, I also learned that part of that, of course, was simply um, <clears throat> people saying that do dogs, I mean, I actually read this and you might know better than I do, you know, dogs don't dominate anybody, so therefore we shouldn't be dominating them when we train them. Um, well, that's wrong. Dogs do form dominance relationships, but we still shouldn't be dominating them <laughs> in a, a sort of aggressive way when we're trying to teach them what to do. So, you know, that so that's just uh, that's all I really can say about dominance. It's not always people equate dominance with fighting and serious threatening, which it's not. And then use of the word alpha um, people. You wrote some articles saying that a very famous wolf researcher named uh, David Meech said there weren't alpha wolves. That he never said that, but he's an ethologist like I am. And what he was saying is, is that being alpha doesn't mean you have the run of the mill and you beat everyone up. It just means that you might be the highest ranking individual. And in wild dog parks, we see these um, dominance relationships, but it's just a descriptive term. It means you're the top dog. It doesn't mean you're the most aggressive. It doesn't mean that you go around beating everyone else up to um, express your dominance. Right. Well, one of the yeah. things I, I tend to tell people, I said one of the reasons why dogs were domesticated, were the first domesticated animals, because their social structure is so similar to humans. They have a familial structure just like we do, and it meshes well with, with the human experience. And if you think about it, within any given family, your relationships vary. And then outside, your relationship to your boss is very different than your relationship to your spouse or your relationship to your kids. And so that dominance, it could be just a control of a resource. I know that my clumber spaniel, when it comes to marrow bones, she needs to have one in her crate because if my other dog has one, Clementine will assume it. She will just. Yeah. And so I just have to be careful about that. But there's other things that Zuzu cares about more, and so Clementine will acquiesce to her. So I think the idea of dominance is more the idea of, of resources and relationships. And it, as you said, it's not about sort of demanding that you concede to my will or I'm going to threaten you until you do. Yeah, what you're describing we call in ethology situational dominance. I can control a bone over you but I can't control a tennis ball, for example. It's situational. And situational means, um, I write about this in Dogs Domesticated. In, in ethology, there's a residency effect where animals who are on their home turf, their home territory, feel more confident and can often do things that they don't even dare try to do when they're away from home. And you could see this in dogs when they're in their house versus when they're outside or they're on their own land, out, you know, their own property outside. It's not that they necessarily defend the area, but it's their home. So it's context dependent. But I have people ask me in person or write to me and say, yeah, I've got two dogs, you know, Joe and Mary. Joe controls the bones. Mary controls the tennis balls. And Mary is much more sensitive to where Joe is in terms of which room he's in. So she'll defend the living room, but not the kitchen or, you know, whatever it is. So that's what, once again, that why I find um, citizen science to be so appealing is because people will go, wow, that's really interesting. I never knew that. And that's great. It's not because they're dumb. It's just they never bothered trying to figure out this situational say dominance or situational resource guarding, which is a big term in, you know, training. Sometimes my dogs would guard, if you will, um, a scrap of food in the dining room next to the kitchen. But when it was in the living room in the other front door, it didn't matter. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of crazy. One of the things I was thinking about is the fact that uh, when you bring a new dog home, the way that dog behaves the first few days in the new home is very different than the way he's going to behave after he's been there for a while. Because of the fact that you don't know if you're in a new place or a new environment, I think you tend to sort of tamper down your behavior a little bit until you understand what the rules are or whether or not I'm safe here or 
what's going on. So I think sometimes that a dog who's on his home turf, now it's, it's just, this is my, com- this is my comfort zone and I know what the rules are. And as opposed to when I'm over at your house, I'm not sure what the rules are. It's kind of like when you go to, you know, you go to stay with somebody that that's why, you know, after three days, you know, guests should go home because I think we get too comfortable <laughs> in other people's houses. Right. I mean, you're really, you're hitting all the relevant nails on the head because once again, dogs will behave in different ways when they're, when they're in one place rather than another, where they feel safer, where they're familiar than unfamiliar. Um, and, and once again, that's, that's what makes to me studying dogs so phenomenally interesting is that they're so variable and, and it's not like, you can characterize people too well. He or she is assertive. Well, they might overall be assertive, but there might be situations where they're not. So you really want to describe where you may see the assertive behavior or, you know, behavior that borders on aggression or behavior that shows the dog to be uncomfortable if they're always acting submissively or always trying to, say, appease another dog. That's stressful on humans, and it would be stressful on dogs. So what do you do? You take them to places where they feel good, and you avoid places where they don't. And if you are indifferent, don't say, I'm not going to take them there because it doesn't do anything for me. Well, it's not all about you. (laughs) I I like what you said. um, Take them for a lean because the walk, too, it's for the dog and and get Get ready to give your dog the best walk they can have and don't use it for your exercise. I mean, you may get exercise doing it, but let your dog tell you what they want to do for a half hour or, you know, whatever you can do. Right. Uh, Zazzy Todd calls it a sniffari. One of the best things you can do for your dog is to take him on a sniffari. I've seen that. Yes, it's it's great. (laughs) Well, and it's. It's always, I, I will say, Colleen is actually the, the previous uh, co-host, what I jokingly refer to as Julie's first podcast wife. I was on the phone with her one day, exasperated because one of our newest dogs, I was in a rush to get him a little bit of exercise and get him out and pottied and having a little bit of ex- exploration. And he decided to just plunk down in the sun and sunbathe. Uh And so I was talking to her on the phone about something completely unrelated, but I'm having a little bit of a fuss with him of like, come on, we're like, we're doing something. And she really gently said, whose walk is it? Yep. And I was like, it's his. And she's like, then why do you care how he spends it? And I was like, oh, curses. (laughs) It's not about me. And it was a really beautiful, gentle reminder of while I might think, He would enjoy X, Y, Z. Maybe today he just Mm. wants to sunbathe and enjoy the pretty weather and smell in the smells while he's laying in the sun. Well, yeah, dogs can have good and bad days just like humans can. Dogs can have bad dreams and good dreams and nightmares. You know, I mean, and, and once people realize, you know, once again, it's obvious that dogs are mammals and that you know, like us, they have the same neuroanatomy, if you will, the same neurotransmitters, the same array of emotions. So sometimes we have quote bad days. We wake up and things just are crappy and we're moody and we're on the edge. And some days nothing at all bothers us. So, you know, people need to respect dogs for having those if you will, um, emotional days, the ups and the downs. And when you do that, then you don't have these expectations that your dog should or always does something. And if they don't, there's something wrong with them. There's, I mean, it could be wrong with them that they're having a bad day, but it doesn't mean there's something wrong with them physically say it. And I will tell you like one that sticks in my craw is the person who's like, well, the dog is just stubborn. And, and I have said, Uh, too many times to count. I have worked with dogs since 1979. I have yet to meet a stubborn dog. I meet lots of stubborn people. I'm one of them. (laughs) Um, But I have never, I have never observed a dog who was just like, I'm not doing what you want on the principle of I'm not doing what you want. There's a whole bunch of reasons why they might not do what we're asking or might not understand what we're trying to teach or might not behave the way we understand. But I've never seen any evidence that a dog just goes, well, I'm not doing it on principle. I've just, I've never observed that. So Absolutely. 
I mean, that you should. I mean, I'm sure you have. You got to get that message out because, yeah, sometimes they may say the hell I'm not doing it. They could be bored. They could be scared. There could you be could, not a good enough reason, right? right? They're busy smelling where the bunny was last night and you want them to like, I don't know, chew on a boring bone. It, no, exactly. And, and right. And they may hear you really well and they just don't want to do something. They may be bored. Once again, you know, that's all part of being a citizen scientist in the sense of trying to understand what causes a behavior or what causes them to do something that's unusual or to not do something, say that's usual. It doesn't mean they're a bad dog. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with them. It just means that maybe you're not communicating what you would like from them clear enough or they're just saying, look, give me a break. I just want to be a dog today and, and exercise my nose. I don't care if I walk two miles. I want to sniff for 20 minutes. Um, but once again, you know, that gets back to what we started with, that these dogs who feel that they have that agency and the freedom to express their dogness and to express their own personalities, I think generally are happier dogs and are easier to teach what we want them to know. Yeah. Well, I, I think so all of us sitting here at, you know, at the kitchen table here at the Your Family Dog podcast are of an age where we were raised with pretty compulsive training modalities. That was the norm, right? There was, it was, you tell the dog what to do. If they're a good dog, they do the thing that you told them to do. If they don't do the thing, you do mean stuff until they do comply with what you do. And then you release them by telling them they're a good dog. That's, that's how most of us at our ages were raised. And so I will own that for me, I had to really wrestle this idea of if we give them more agency, will they ever do, you know, like, are they ever going to let a vet touch them? Are they ever going to do any of the things that we want them to do? And so for me, I had to wrestle personally, like if I give a dog the opportunity to opt out, will they ever opt in? And I, I am happy to report that I finally just threw my concerns to the wind and tried. Mm -hmm. And what I have observed is what you're talking about, that the more we're giving that dog more agency, the more often the dog is like, well, you've taken an interest in me and I'm going to take more of an interest in what you want, human. And that they do choose to opt in the vast majority of the time. Yeah, and I think that they're picking up that whatever's going on in their head what, what they're really picking up is that they have these freedoms and they're not afraid of you and they know what pleases you. I mean, I think they really feel that it's a reciprocal give and take relationship and they're they're willing to give and take just like we are. And they, and they feel safe. I mean, to me, that's the biggest thing. They just they feel love. They feel safe. They know that they can come to you for security and comfort if they need it. I mean, it's, you know, when I talk to people who are developmental psychologists or counselors who work on, you know, say, child psychologists, they'll say, well, yeah, I mean, it's like, hello. And because you're also working with young kids who can't talk to you like they're an adult and can't necessarily give verbal consent like, okay, and all that. You know, I mean, I think this is. This is really, really important stuff. And I'm really glad we're talking about it because we're so free in saying, or some people, well, dogs don't have feelings. They don't really enjoy playing. They don't do this. And then, or empathy or pleasure. And we make the same attributions to pre-verbal kids who can't tell us in language, whatever your language is, that they enjoy something or they're afraid. Well, One of the things that I was going to yeah, ask you about like, too is, is, is that, I think people think that e- emotions should be subservient to reason. And I don't think that's necessarily true because I no. think that there's this evolution. M- emotions make sense evolutionarily. And yep. so if they serve us evolutionarily, right, by making us much more aware of ourselves, our surrounding others, then it seems to me that it yep. would make sense for emotions to be evolutionarily important to other species as well. And so I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Well, yeah, I mean, I always say the real question isn't if 
emotions have evolved. It's why they've evolved. And they've evolved, you know, as a biologist, as an ethologist, because they're adaptive. They motivate behavior. You know, they motivate feelings on which we act. They regulate behavior. They control behavior. They direct behavior, whatever words you want to use. And from a biological point of view, there's no way humans are the only mammal who have evolved different emotions and feelings. I mean, it would be insane to think that, but you're right. I mean, dogs rely on their feelings. They read us really well. And once again, a lot of times what happens is they have certain feelings emerge and they're reading what you're feeling by maybe odor, sound, visual cues, how you're walking, how you're standing. And then they're making assessments of what's, if you will, what's the best thing to do in a certain situation. And they're not going to do it just to please you necessarily. I mean, they will if they've been dominated and they're afraid that you're going to beat them if they don't do something. But for a healthy dog, like a healthy kid, they're not going to do it just simply to please you unless they fear that there'll be retribution. And the bottom line is they really want to do it because they know that it's you'll like it, they'll like it, and it's good for your relationship. So that was actually, that leads up to the question I was going to ask you. So do you think that this is true more so in the, if we just said mammals, in the mammals that live in some version of a tribe? So like dolphins live in a pod, orcas live in a pod, lions live in a pride, humans, we have our little family groups and then our towns and villages and and all of that. Dogs live in a, a loosely affiliated pack. Do you think that this emotionality, this this idea of greater emotion than kind of just the bare basics, do you think that that's more about socially living in a unit that ha- that we're integrated, that we're connected, and that we rely on one another for the entire group's success? Yeah, that's a great question. A huge question in ethology and animal behavior is whether complexity of social interactions, emotions um, are related to sociality. There's no real evidence for that. So in other words, like if you take two solitary or, you know, two animals who may not be as social and they're put together, they're usually pretty darn good at communicating with one another if they have to. But I think what you're asking is great because there might be more nuances. So like if you're used to living in a group of a certain size or a certain um, composition, you may be more practiced. If you will, if there are degrees of socialization, if you're more highly socialized than you're a wolf or a dog and you've had more varied social interactions, you may be better able to sort of nuance saying I want to play with you or I don't want anything to do with you. But it's, it's a great question. Um, people have looked at that. So among canids, my mentor, Michael Fox, learned that foxes had fewer distinct facial expressions than coyotes, and coyotes had fewer distinct facial expression than wolves. And there's some degree of sociality there, but foxes and coyotes can live in large groups just like wolves, and wolves can live on their own. But from an evolutionary point of view, it's interesting to ponder whether wolves actually show more subtle or more complex or more nuanced patterns of social communication. Well, and I imagine some of it has to do with pressure, right? If we think about humans, humans living in a war-torn country where there's famine and disease, I would assume that communication and sociability and emotion is really different than if they're living somewhere where there are not those pressures because there's time to play instead of just trying to survive. No, absolutely. I was looking at your question in a bigger sense, but absolutely. But they would all have the potential in other circumstances to communicate as if situation is different. Yeah. So you'll see in packs of dogs, I've seen this in free ranging dogs. You can see it in packs of coyotes and wolves that, you know, an animal may not express their feelings in a certain way simply because they've been taught not to. You know, I mean, they they're afraid to. But in a more friendly atmosphere, they might feel more just like we would be. You know, you get in a group where you 
you either don't feel comfortable or you don't like somebody and you just decide, I'm not going to say anything because it, it ain't going to matter anyway. Non-humans can do the same. That your question is so important because even among insects, there was a study that showed that some of their vocalizations seem to be, there's either more of them or they're more nuanced in larger groups, you know, but you'd expect that. Once again, you know what a great answer is too. If you look at dogs who have been reared and haven't been properly socialized, they don't seem to have the same nuanced, say, um, facial expressions or vocalizations that we may have, you know, in, in a larger group. So I, I love this question because I'm an evolutionary biologist. This all applies to dog-human relationships where people go, no, my dog is dumb. There's no such thing as a dumb dog. My dog is autistic. I've heard people say that, or my dog doesn't get it. Well, the dog may not get it, but it might be because you don't pull out the behavior because of the social situation in which they find themselves. Well, so two of the dogs that I live with are wild-born dogs on Turks and Caicos, right? So two pot cake from Turks and Caicos. And I will tell you that that those dogs are fundamentally different yep. than my other two dogs who are purebred dogs. I don't think either came from the world's best breeder, but they're they're purebred dogs that were like raised in someone's kitchen. There are phenomenal differences between those dogs that were <laughs> caught as young puppies and brought into my house and socialized and reared, it is the perfect example that nurture is not all there is, that nature and genetics have a tremendous say. Because if I had done things, a dog's <laughs> I'm only holding this our new book up. That's the bottom line message to a dog's world. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, that's beautiful. But, I love it. I'll that, have to get a copy. Bottom line message is how will dogs do without humans? Most dogs will make it, but that's not an anti-human thing, but some will do better than others. Yes. Dogs who were free ranging and feral, if we disappeared in a heartbeat, will likely do better than your average home dogs. That's not a negative statement. It's just they've got they're more street smart. Clemmy I mean, doesn't even know where the tacos grow that she could go eat tacos without Julie. Yes. Oh, yeah. No. yeah okay, okay. My clumber spaniel, um, Clementine, <laughs> has. Um, she's just. Let's put it this way. Every line is, "Oh, you're a good dog for a clumber." Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> everything is qualified. Yes, everything has to be qualified. Oh, for a clumber. Like I got a box of clothing in the mail, and she decided to eat the corner of the box because it's clothing, Clemmy. I mean, it's, it's, but you know, we have to know what's inside the box. So she's no. just a crazy dog. You know, one of the things I wanted to say is that when you're talking about, you know, responsiveness of of animals and socialization, is it are animals that are more social? I, two things came to mind. One is an incredibly intelligent and highly emotional animal, but a solitary individual are the octopuses. They are incredible. I mean, they don't even have a quote unquote yeah. brain and yet they have a wide range of emotions. They're incredibly smart. And I think that that's sort of like, okay, they're considered a fairly unevolved in some ways individuals, but they are incredibly fascinating to me because of their intelligence and their, their emotions. And I was reading this great book by um, Susan Orlean about, uh, about Octopi, and she was talking about there was one that um, had very definite preferences for its caretakers. And if mm -hmm. one was there, the tentacle would come out and caress the caretaker's face. Another one, though, if that one showed up, they would squirt ink at the individual, so or, or you know, water out of its siphon. And so it's, I think that that you can say that emotions and social ability are there's there's a strong genetic component as well as being modified by in environment. I you know I don't think anybody worth their salt in science anymore talks about nature versus nurture. It's no. nature and nurture. Then the other I, thing I wanted to say is is that. Think about post-pandemic, what happened to so many kids heading back to school that they lacked a lot of the social interaction at critical mm -hmm. time periods. They had really hard time reintegrating these kids back into school. I'm not saying that they couldn't be, but boy, the number of stories I heard about kids who had such a difficult time getting back into that social situation, 
I think that that social skills are something that need to be practiced, that they're not just innate, but they need to be practiced. Once again, that nature and nurture. Oh, yeah. I mean, concerning octopuses, it turns out and I, that they have eight brains, one in each tentacle. They and, and there's so much new research going on. A woman named Cy Montgomery wrote a great book about them, but I've actually met yeah, some. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually listening to that on audiobook right okay. now, and it's phenomenal. Like, yeah. I love it. I mean, the, re- the research on um, octopuses, they're highly emotional. They change color. They're very different from us, so they don't communicate like we do. But really, um, the leading octopus scientists really have, you know, they sort of talk about them as having a brain in each tentacle and, and they are very emotional. And so the emotions are there and we learn to modify them, you know, and, and like, you know, you were saying, you know, if you're reared in a certain way, you may not display joy, but you, you have the capacity to have it pulled out of you. And it's called social learning. You just basically learn from social interactions and, who you're acting with, uh, who you're um, interacting with as to what would be okay to do. I can say certain things to you that I couldn't say to others or vice versa. And and that's really huge because what it means is that there are hardwired behaviors, anti-predatory behaviors are hardwired. You want to get away from a predator when you're young because you want to live long enough maybe to have your own children, for example. But it doesn't mean they're not modified. But we're constantly learning throughout our every day of our life um, patterns of social interaction. What are the rules of engagement with you versus Joe or Mary versus Helen? Dogs are learning that, too. I mean, I have a dog here who I think is quite a pain in the butt, but he's a great dog. And I like the dog a lot. And his human. Is this dog, dog named Clementine? Is, no. Or Mr. No, no, no. No, I mean, the dog is is wonderful, but I, I think, you know, sometimes their human just doesn't get certain things. And the dog is a lot like his human, who I really like, too. But they just they're different. It's not bad or good. It's just they're different. But the dog knows now and, and this won't surprise you what what he can do to with me and what he can't and with others. You know, he can have certain degrees of freedom with me certain degrees of freedom with others. And that's all part of learning to be socialized to your world. What can I do with Mary? What can I do with Susan? So it's not necessarily gendered. Well, what can I do with men versus females? I mean, hello. No, I mean, I say that because, because no, but people with dogs know this, but they don't realize they know it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Like I have learned, I have to ask humans lots of questions to get them realizing they know more about their dog than they realize that they know, right? Like simple things like saying when your puppy falls asleep loose in the house, does the puppy fall asleep on a solid surface, like the air conditioning vent, (laughs) or do they fall asleep on the cushy dog bed? Because if you're putting a big cushy dog bed in their crate, that might be part of why they're fussing about being in the crate if they're just hot. Right. So yep. there's oh, yeah. there's a lot of just asking questions that help humans navigate like, no, you do know more than you like. You don't know more than me. You know more about your study of one of that one dog than I do. You just never thought about it. Exactly. And when you talk to people like you're talking, most people will go, you're right. You know, I've noticed this or that, but they but they didn't know what to make of it because they're not dog fluent or li- dog literate. There's nothing wrong with them. The same thing with enrichment. I'm t- I'll go back to my example of our two pot cake. One, if you give him food enrichment toys, he is in heaven. He thinks that is the most fun any dog could ever have other than cuddling with mom, watching, you know, I don't know, napping together. Yep. The other one I can literally just put the food in a different container loose. It's complete. He could just turn it over and it would dump out. And he just looks at me like I have lost my last marble. And why am I making breakfast hard? Yep. Right Now, in theory, if he read the manual, dogs should like 
working for that food more than just getting out of a bowl. And I'm slowly trying to get him to be a little more explorative about it and to enjoy the challenge. But most of the time he just looks at me like I have two heads. No, you're, no, you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, all these, what we're talking about now just explains that there's no universal dog. There's no universal human. There's no universal dog human relationship. So You know, especially if you think there's something going awry, you've got to look at the situation and figure out how to deal with it. But there's not necessarily something wrong with the dog or wrong with the human or even wrong with the relationship. It's just it has to be changed to make. I mean, in some ways, just to make the dog more. I mean, sometimes it comes down to making the dog more adaptable to fit into a human world, because in the end, they're the ones who are going to pay the price if they don't do what they're supposed to do. Right. And I was thinking in some ways, this is where you talk in Canine Confidential too, about the difference between teaches, teaching versus training. And I think yeah. what we're talking here about is training means, okay, you need to understand that you go outside to go potty or you know, I'm training you to do a particular behavior. When I was training a, a dog for um, a service dog, I had to train him to do particular activities. But teaching is kind of what Tina's doing with the podcast and kind of what I'm trying to do with Zuzu, which is to teach you, to educate you that there's a part of the world that you might really enjoy if you took another look at it. And I think there's a big difference between teaching and training in that you can actually do both with your dog. And and when you're thinking about teaching, you know, somebody said to me, well, you know, when, when you teach humans, you give them grades A, B, and C. Right. But you don't typically conclude that if they don't do everything at an A level, that they're dumb or they're uneducatable. Or stubborn. (laughs) Or or stubborn. Yeah, the stubborn thing I was going to say, I wrote an article last year, I think, about excessive barking, quote, excessive barking. Well, if a dog's barking a lot and it's not typical, there's usually something bugging the dog. I mean, it's just fun. Or, or they enjoy doing it. But I always say the word excessive in many cases is really human generated, right? Do I like it when my neighbor's dogs or I don't really have that many neighbors, but, you know, bark all the time? I don't. But I wouldn't yell at them to say bad dog because they're not being a bad dog. They're being a dog. There's obviously something that's bugging them or they're trying to get attention. to, Or to they're have, bored. Or, or they're, they're bored. Yeah, right. Yeah, that, yeah. that the dog doesn't have enough enrichment. So it's creating their own enrichment. And I, I don't know about you. I'm constantly talking to people about those behaviors that you're that the average owner is viewing as problematic is often the dog communicating exactly what kind of enrichment they want. Right. The dog that's sticking their head in the trash can wants more seeking games. Right. So play hide and go seek and play, hot, you know, do food scatters. Right. Like it gives you information the same way that my kids, how they explored the world, gave me a window into what chilled their jello, what what made them fulfilled. And it wasn't the same when the child was three as it was when the child was 13. Typically, it was going to morph over time. And my experience is the same thing happens with the dogs. Well, you know, you. Everything we've been talking about today, but this last 10 minutes is precisely almost the foundation of my new book and why I wrote it is, well, no, I mean, seriously, because well, you're just smart and pretty. That's all there is to it. Like- no, not at all. It's just that I looked at <laughs> a lot of, you know, I looked at emails that came in. I looked at discussions I've had when I've given talks in person or online. And these are the questions And the topics that come up. I I mean, seriously, I remember it was a labor of love. I mean, I worked on it for a few years, almost every day. But I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a guide that, you know, where you don't have to read every page sequentially. You can go A to B to D to X. and Or you can say, oh, my dog is doing this. What does it mean? And then you could go alphabetically. I mean, it was really meant, it's meant to be an accessible handbook. Or so I keep, I keep threatening to write a book that juxtapositions the human's email or call to me and the dog's 
if the dog could email or call me, yeah, what that disconnect would be. I actually, I have a section like that. <laughs> oh, good. Excellent. Not I can't section, wait. I, I absolutely yeah. can't wait because no. a lot of times I'm like, okay, like it's like marriage counseling. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's not what that dog's saying. Like, he's not saying you're a jerk. He's saying he likes this better. He doesn't really like meatloaf. He really, really likes venison. He just doesn't want meatloaf every Wednesday. Like, he's he doesn't hate you. Like, he's not being antagonistic. Just meatloaf isn't his jam. Can we get more venison? <laughs> it's, no, it, it precisely what you just said. And and really, I mean, these are this is great for me because I'm always looking for new ways to say things. But yeah, I mean, it, it's just it's in fact trying to simplify, say, a complex mammal and the complex relationships they form with other dogs, other animals, including humans. And what you just said is it's it's just right on the mark. I, I mean, I tell people and most people come to realize it, that when you when you have this basic knowledge, it just makes your life easier and better with your canine companion. And it's daunting to some people. Oh, I got a dog. I mean, the bottom line is, oh, I got a dog because I just wanted company, but I really didn't want to do much to learn who they are. And then they learn that dogs are highly social beings. And if you don't really interact with them, then you've got yourself a nutcase who's who's going to bug you. And then what's going to happen is you're going to give them up. They're not sending you back to a kennel or a humane society. You're sending them back and, and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do think if the terrier had the opportunity, he would totally return me from whence I came because I have entirely too many rules. Like he's not allowed in the HVAC system and he's not allowed to kill the cat. Like, yeah. There's just too many rules at this establishment. And, and when I said before, too, those are perfectly acceptable rules because you don't want a human doing either of those things either. But but I think it's a fine balance because we are in control ultimately for a dog to know or another companion animal to know that, yeah, that human being over there can control my life. But, you know, they're, they're giving me flexibility. They're giving me degrees of freedom. So there's certain things I might have to do that I don't particularly want to do. We do the same. But I know that they're going to allow me to express my dogness. And I've only got about five minutes. I'm sorry. I could go on. All, I could do another talk. But <laughs> Oh, we, we would love to have you on for another couple hours. And I was just about to say, I think you have another interview coming up. Yeah, so no, but that's OK. I, I didn't mean to cut it off. No, no, great. no. It's been great. Um, is there any last thing that you would like to tell the listeners of your family dog before we wrap this up? No, I mean, I appreciate their being there. I, if they have great stories, email them to me. <laughs> Um, you can find out more about me at my homepage, which is markbeckoff.com. And Demystifying Dogs will be out in June. And no, I love these just, um, I love these sort of impromptu discussions because if I sat down now, which I'm not going to do, you might do it, but, <laughs> and, and I made a list of all the topics we talked about, it would be, you know, a certain percentage of my new book because this is, this is really why I wanted to lay it out A to Z because I wanted people who wanted to learn more. They might be having problems with their dog or they might just want to learn more to be able to access this information without having to scroll through a book. You know, too many books today don't even have an index, which is really irritating yeah. to me. I hate or that. Go- I love indexes. I, I do too. Um, you know, but to be accessible and also there's cross references in the book from one topic to another. So a lot of the cross references will be, they'll be clear why they're there, but some are surprises. And some, one of my editors who loves dogs and knows dogs said, well, why don't you cross reference this topic with that topic? And I'll say, I never thought about it. I mean, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I'm so buried in the dog world. So yeah, but no, thank you. This is great. I appreciate being on here with you. Well, we're just absolutely delighted. And I would tell anybody, 
that we any were, of you know, your books are fabulous. I have several of them, and, and I just, I, I, I have been telling everybody I could find during this week, you're not going to believe who's going to be on your family dog this week. It's going to be Mark Beckoff. I'm <laughs> just there. We're, we've been like we're fangirling you pretty hard oh, yes. nice. we fine. would we would love to have you back because i love personally kind of like zazzy todd big science brains who can talk to mere mortals like us and and integrate this these really important Excellent. yeah and big concepts into something you can do at the kitchen table i love it it's just great no, thank Zazie. you for blessing us with your presence. Yes, thank today. you. No, that's great. No, and Zazie is great about doing that, too. I mean, she, yeah. Well, you know, you can stay in the ivory tower and talk to your colleagues in the wall, but I can't think of a better topic than dogs or other companion animals to go out into the public. Nobody's, I mean, there are some people who don't like some of my views. No one's ever criticized my science. And that's what's important to me. I'm not married to science. But when people go, well, what does the science say? And you tell them, they'll go, oh, I didn't know that. Not because they're dumb. They just didn't know it. So, yeah, let's do this again when the book comes out. That would be grand. Oh, that would be <laughs> lovely. We would definitely like to have you back. Yeah. And um, we will definitely put a link on our webpage, not only to yours, but to um, to your book so people can pre-order it. That so, sounds great. Thank all you. All right. Well, we, thank oh, you. And we did. We did want to say that the if you go to pre-order and you see a cover on Amazon that has a Frenchie on it, that is a tentative cover that it will not be the cover. For yeah, you the can, book. you know, the, be, the best, yeah, you can say, you can, however you want to say it, you know, yeah, that would be fine. Mark yeah, doesn't yeah. need any emails about. French bulldogs French. on the cover of his of his book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, make sure that's coming from you. Although I agree. Yeah, <laughs> send me both of your addresses, and I'll make sure each of you get a book. That's so kind. Well, that's really oh, wonderful. Yeah. No, Thank no. you. Yeah, we Thank will. you. That's very kind. Very good. Great. All right. Well, Great. off you go to your next Thank interview, you. Mark. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much you for so joining much. us. We'll, we'll stay in touch. That'd be great. That'd be great. Thank Thanks. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to Your Family Dog. Got questions? Interesting ideas? Visit www.yourfamilydogpodcast.com to share your thoughts.